Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to Upswell for including me and including this topic with the summit this year. I'm Patrice Sultan. I'm an attorney and law professor in Washington, DC. And last year, with the help of my law students, I launched an organization called DC Justice Lab to focus on transformative changes to our local criminal legal system here. And I'm so glad to be here with all of you today to talk about how we turned protests into real meaningful policy solutions here in the District of Columbia. And and before we begin, I just wanted to thank uh, Kiki and Anna for helping me with the slides and polls and making sure everything runs smoothly today. I really appreciate your help this afternoon. Kiki, if I could ask you to go to the next slide for me, please. Great. So the things that I really want everyone to take away from our session together here um, are three things. The first is thinking about reimagining systems together, fully reimagining policing, prosecution, and punishment. These are all the areas in which we have authorized state actors to inflict violence on communities in an effort to reduce violence in communities. And only by thinking about all of those things together can we really make a meaningful difference. The second thing that we were going to talk about is prioritizing transformative change, right? The magnitude of the change that we're looking for really, really matters in terms of the outcomes that we see implemented on the ground. And the third thing is the importance of centering impacted voices and collaborating in an authentic way and how to go about doing that. Could I have the next slide, please? The next thing that we're going to really focus on this afternoon is answering the questions, what does long lasting change look like after 2020 and how can it be accelerated? And as I'm going about asking those questions, I'm really hoping to hear from all of you about the questions you have relating to these topics and relating to anything else that I'm talking about today. So please feel free throughout the presentation to go ahead and start asking questions through the chat feature and we will have a section for questions and answers toward the end of the presentation and hopefully we'll be able to engage with some of the more specific um, areas of interest that you all uh, think of throughout our conversation. So last year we saw a lot of protests but more importantly we saw a sea change in the way people started to think about who we punish, why we punish, and how we punish. And I'd like to ask Anna to help me cue our first poll for those of you who are with us already. And we have three questions as part of this poll. So the first question is, did you participate in a demonstration last summer? And it's a yes or a no. And the second question is, did your state at your local jurisdiction, or maybe even at the national level, pass a reform in response to the demonstrations that you saw or participated in? And the third part of the question is, did those reforms that you've seen here or in another community make a difference in the day-to-day -day lives of the people who live around you? Right, so really just reflecting back over the last year, right, everybody, lives within a short distance of somewhere that demonstrations were happening. And what we're trying to do here is figure out how engaged were folks who are at our summit today um, in these demonstrations and were those demonstrations by themselves a catalyst for, ch for change in people's everyday lives. Thank you so much for the answers to those polls. It looks like a lot of people participated in the demonstrations. Great. So one thing that came out of the demonstrations is that we heard people starting to question the reliance on government to react to violence and call for investments in community to prevent violence from happening in the first place. And that was a real change in the national conversation, something that people who have lived in neighborhoods that are heavily policed have understood for a long time and something that researchers have understood and demonstrated for a long time suddenly became widely popularized in public discourse. And that is that when we arrest people in mass and when we cage people in mass or incarcerate people in mass, it's not just ineffective, right? It actually causes more crimes. A lot of the aggressive policing we see, the mass incarceration we see has its own criminogenic effect and is not only um, failing to keep crime from happening, but is actually destabilizing and debilitating communities in a way that makes us all less safe. 
So when we launched DC Justice Lab last summer, the hope was to bring an evidence-based community safety solution agenda to the district and to do it in a way that other localities could easily copy. And when we say easily copy, we don't mean mimic exactly what we did here, but the model of how we went about changing the law here is something that can be replicated and tailored well to other jurisdictions. And we'll talk today about the importance of tailoring those solutions to individual communities and why we need to do it that way. All right. So if I could have the next slide, please, Kiki. All right. So we really had a few principles in mind when we were starting the organization. One is that we really wanted to focus on things that were grounded in evidence and well supported by study. And the other is that we wanted to work directly with community on these solutions. So my background is as a, a criminal defense attorney who represented indigent defendants in criminal cases and juvenile delinquency cases, who then went on to do a lot of legislative drafting through a really special project here in DC to rewrite the entire criminal code. And what I realized is that in a lot of places, we have folks who are um, calling for change, who are talking about the problems, and then another group of folks, oftentimes from outside of our communities, working on crafting the legislation or crafting the solutions or implementing the solutions. And something is being lost in translation where those solutions don't actually manifest, or if they do manifest, they're not actually working in an effective way. So what's new about what we're doing is that we don't have that sort of silo of one community and another community. We're working together um, to draft legislative language with people who are directly impacted. So a couple of the things that we have thought of as our, as our grounding principles are that we have to be really proactive. So for many years in the District of Columbia, which is supposed to be like one of the most progressive jurisdictions, the best educated jurisdiction in the country, we have the highest incarceration rate, we have the blackest jail in the entire country. And the reason that um, people are not able to pass solutions that make a big difference is that we're reacting to one issue of public concern at a time, instead of taking a more proactive approach and setting an agenda and moving those proposals forward. So what we try to do is, is teach people who are directly impacted about how to take a problem that they've observed, turn that into an idea for a solution, translate that solution into an actual bill or policy if it's something for the executive branch to do, get that bill passed right through advocacy and make sure that it's implemented in a way that it actually turns into an outcome. And one thing that I've learned over the past year is that there are a lot of myths out there about the um, about who's allowed to engage in that work. In particular, um, one thing that I wanted this audience to understand especially is that it is allowable for nonprofit organizations to engage in lobbying and advocacy. Both direct lobbying and grassroots lobbying are allowed. They're not prohibited in the way that endorsing a political candidate is prohibited. And an organization that was really helpful to us as we got started is um, the Alliance for Justice and their Boulder Advocacy Program. And I would encourage anyone who's asking yourselves as I'm talking, like, can we even engage in, in legislative drafting and lobbying um, as a nonprofit to visit that website and see all of the resources that they have and see the trainings that they have available so that you can better understand um, how you can bring together the work that you're doing on the ground and the work that people are doing um, in your house or Senate in whichever state you're in. And the last principle that we really tried to, uh, to keep in mind as we're turning these proposals into policies is even though we're thinking about a really comprehensive agenda, we don't stuff everything into a single piece of legislation, right? So sometimes you'll see people moving forward a piece of legislation in the district and it becomes like a Christmas tree where we add on new ornaments of other things that seem tangentially related to that idea. And the problem with that is not just sort of the political damage that can happen to the bill. The problem with it is that we end up with a really, really inconsistent and overlapping laws and our code becomes sprawling in a way that it can't be effectively implemented. We have things on the books that directly um, or indirectly conflict with one another. 
So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the District of Columbia's criminal legal system in particular, even though I know that there are a lot of you here from outside of DC, but just to use this as an example for, for how things might be able to change for the better. So if we could have the next slide, Kiki, I'm gonna walk everybody through just a short quiz. All right, so our first question, if you could reveal that for me, is DC counted the number of police stops over a five month period. I want you all to just think about before I tell you how many stops you think we had, just police stops. We're talking about traffic stops. We're talking about pedestrian stops. Just over five months. This was from July to December of 2019. So this was pre-pandemic, but we didn't get the numbers until last year. The answer to this question is we had 63,000 police stops that were actually recorded and reported by the Metropolitan Police Department. And that's in addition to dozens of other police agencies that we have here in DC. That's a lot of police interaction with civilians. The next question that we have for you here is what percentage of people sentenced in the District of Columbia are black? Our city is 40.9% black as of this 2020 census. And I want people to think about what percentage of, of folks who are, who are sentenced in DC are, are African-American? And the answer to that question is 93% of people sentenced for adult crimes in the district are black. When we look at the, the juvenile delinquency data, it's even higher. We have many years in which it's 100% black and Latino kids who are committed for juvenile delinquency uh, in the District of Columbia, even though we're less than half of the population at this point in time. And then the last question is, I know that people have been talking a lot about spending on policing, but we spend money on other, um, on other government functions relating to policing prosecution and punishment as well. So I want you all to just sort of think to yourselves, how much do you think DC, which is a city of about 700,000 people, how much do we spend to supervise people accused or convicted of offenses in DC? So these are people on pretrial supervision or on probation or on parole. And this is on an annual basis, right? So in addition to our police budget, which is about $550 million a year, the District of Columbia spends another $250 million a year supervising people just accused of, of DC code offenses, which is a tremendous amount of money. I think most people will agree. So oftentimes when people ask me to describe our system of punishment in DC, I say it's way too big, it's way too black, and it's way too expensive to be effective or fair. And that's what we really set out to change. All right, if I could have the next slide, please. So in DC, we have really tried to um, focus on transformative change. And I wanted to just highlight a couple of things that we've gotten done over the last year and a half. And um, at the end of 2019, we passed a measure that uh, no other state has passed yet, but I really want people to be aware of, and that's the Second Look Act. So there are other jurisdictions that have said, if a person's served a long amount of time incarcerated, that that person can go back to a parole board and have um, that executive branch look at whether their sentence should be changed or they're eligible for release. But what we did in the District of Columbia is we said the person can go back to their judge and be resentenced, right? That doesn't mean that everybody gets a reduction in their sentence, but we said, look, if a person was under 25 years old at the time they committed an offense and they've already served 15 years in prison, they should be able to go back to the judge and tell the judge who they've grown into over that 15 year period and have the judge decide what their sentence should be based on what we learned about that individual and based on where we've come as a society over those 15 years. And that's a really big change um, and one that I think is really sensible to a lot of people. It's not an automatic get out of jail free card, but it was a really, a really, um, a really big difference that, that we made here. The second is a lot of jurisdictions have been looking at non-police emergency response and diverting some 911 calls away from police and to mental health care providers. And we were able to launch a pilot program here this summer, um, doing that with some of our 911 calls relating to mental health. We'd love to see that expanded to include other kinds of 911 calls, but this is a starting point and we were able to do that within this first year 
And the last is we had our uh, transit authority, which is um, a DC, Maryland, Virginia organization wanted to ban people who had been uh, accused, arrested, or convicted of certain crimes from being able to, to ride our metro to get home, to get to work, or get anywhere else. And um, a team of organizations, a coalition, worked on each of these things and were able to uh, convince the WMATA board to not uh, take up that recommendation from the Metro Transit Police Chief. In process, we have several bills that are pending. Um, one of them on there, the Youth Rights Amendment Act, I'll start with because there's a hearing happening on that bill right now. And these are all bills that students that I work with helped work on. So when I, when I look at each of these things, I feel immensely proud of the students and the returning citizens who are involved in drafting the legislation. But the Youth Rights Amendment Act would prohibit police from interrogating children without an attorney present. And it would also prohibit consent searches of children in DC. The Vehicular Pursuit Reform Act of 2021 has to do with car chases, roadblocks, and other dangerous things that can happen with police vehicles in our city. We've seen a number of fatalities over the last several years from police using those tactics um, and, and causing more harm than they were preventing. The Restore Act is a comprehensive expungement bill that I would love to see other states model. It really expands um, the number of people who would be eligible to at least ask for record sealing, in addition to automatically sealing uh, records of non-convictions. We have a lot of those here in the District of Columbia. One in seven people uh, has, a, has a publicly available criminal record here. And the last one is one close to my heart. It's called the Revised Criminal Code Act of 2021. And that was the overhaul of DC's criminal code that I mentioned earlier, right? Rewriting all of the offenses and penalties here in the District of Columbia. All right, if I could have the next slide, please. So when we talk about prioritizing transformative change, we have to figure out which proposals to include at the top of our list. So DC had three main documents come out this year, and I was kind of, I was really the only person silly enough to have worked on all three of these, but we started with these proposals, right? So the first thing that you see on your screen is our police reform commission put out a, a list of 90 recommendations about how to invest in community and change policing in a meaningful way in DC. And that uh, report, which uh, I can, it should be easy enough to find online through the DC Police Reform Commission. Um, it really provides this 250 page roadmap for our city about how to transform public safety. And the second one, if you click Kiki, is um, the Jails and Justice Task Force report. And we had a, a group of stakeholders convene for about two years to talk about how we could decarcerate by half over the next 10 years and bring people home from the Bureau of Prisons, which is a uniquely DC problem, um, bring, bring people home from the Federal Bureau of Prisons um, and closer to DC. And then the third one, if we could click again, is the one that I just mentioned, the revised criminal code. Um, and each of these have a lot of recommendations. So the first one is, is 90 different recommendations for policing. The second one is 80 recommendations for jails and justice in DC. And the revised criminal code is about 1900 pages of commentary and about 330 pages of statutory text. So I don't expect anyone to dive into that one in detail, but the um, learning more about it, I think would be something of interest to a lot of states. We're not the only place that needs to, um, that needs to revise their criminal code in a comprehensive way. Thanks so much for sharing that link to the Police Reform Commission report. Um, so when we have all of these proposals, right, these are great starting point. And we can advance to the next slide, please, Kiki. The next question is, how do we go about figuring out how to turn that many changes into real laws. And the way that we've really figured out how to set our agenda at DC Justice Lab is we start at those changes that really transform the rules of engagement, right? So there are a ton of important changes at the beginning of a problem and at the end of a problem. So if we take policing, for example, there are things to tackle with respect to how we recruit and train and hire and retain officers, right? And then there are a ton of things at the end of the system. How do we discipline, terminate, um, criminally prosecute, hold civilly liable police officers? And then there's all this stuff in the middle, 
right, that doesn't get talked about quite as much. And that is that we have a constitutional floor about what police officers can and cannot do, but we also have the ability as individual states and local jurisdictions to say, we want better than the constitutional floor. We wanna change when police can pull over a car. We wanna change when police can interrogate a child. We wanna change when police can stop a person on the street and ask to search their waistband, right? And we wanna give people more protections and we wanna provide more remedies for people when those rights that we've, that we've um, created or fortified are violated. And so our focus at DC Justice Lab has really been on those um, things that change or limit the authority of police, the authority of prosecutors, and the authority of, of um, prisons to inflict state violence in the hopes that when we call for a more tailored approach, it will shift thinking to how do we actually prevent crime instead of how do we react to it um, using the tools that we've been using unsuccessfully for such a long period of time. And if we can go to the next slide, I can show you an example, again, talking about policing. So we really tried to tailor each of our recommendations to DC. And if you click through, you'll be able to see, I think six different reports here, but we launched a campaign with the students last summer and we called it more than a plaza. Some of you may have heard of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter Plaza here in DC. And so at the top where you see more than a plaza on each, that's, that's the reference there. And we said, what is actually going on in the District of Columbia that needs to be fixed, right? So instead of looking at national campaigns and trying to pull all of those solutions and see which ones are needed in DC, we said, no, let's start with what is the need in DC and craft solutions there. So we have one about limiting search warrants and, and eliminating um, search warrants of homes for things like drugs and currency only, finding that um, the harm or the risk of harm actually outweighs any benefit of recovering something like, like drugs or currency when we look at a case like, like what happened with Breonna Taylor. And really, instead of just talking about how something's executed or what we do about it, we're again, we're focusing on what are the rules of engagement. We have a problem with special police, which are security guards in DC who are armed and untrained. Jump outs, which is an, an especially um, aggressive version of stop and frisk that we have in DC. The mature Miranda report you see is, is the youth interrogation bill that I just mentioned. Citing people in lieu of arresting people is something that doesn't happen in DC the way it happens in a lot of other places and consent searches. And that's not just for youth, it's for adults as well. And I know that this, everything's tiny on the screen, but the authors of a lot of these reports are students in local law schools here. So again, instead of thinking about sort of these campaigns that you hear of everywhere and like the list of proposals and seeing which ones can we, can we fit to our jurisdiction, think about what is it that people in the community are saying is problematic about how policing occurs there or how courts run there or about how jails run there and come up with an agenda based on sort of like limiting uh, the risk of harm and reducing the amount of harm that the state is inflicting. All right, and then next, if we could go to the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about what does it mean to center impacted voices and collaborate authentically? And this is something that comes up in conversation over and over again as we're talking to people about how we go about our work, right? So when we say um, that we wrote this expungement bill with returning citizens, I get questions about why did we do it that way? And I also get questions about how did we do it that way? And one question that came up a lot and sort of caught me off guard is I had people asking me over and over again about, well, how do we know that we did stakeholder engagement well? And I kept misunderstanding that question and thinking that people meant, how do we go about this in a way that's really um, authentic and impactful? And then came to realize that the question really was, how do we know when we can check that box, right? Like, how do we know when we actually engaged community and we can say, okay, we did that and then move on with the rest of our, our development of an idea or the rest of our advocacy around an idea. And I think that's the wrong way of thinking about it, right? When we talk about centering the voices of people who are impacted, first of all, we mean at every stage, right? We don't mean talk to them at the development stage and then go do the advocacy at the state house without them. Uh, we don't mean come up with the idea yourself and then have them come testify in support of it when it's time. We mean really having people involved at every stage of development and advocacy. And one thing that someone said in one of these conversations that rang so true for me is that they said, you know, when you're in these community conversations, if nobody is calling you out 
or holding you to task or, or challenging your ideas, right? If everybody's in one accord and there's consensus, you probably haven't built an authentic and meaningful relationship with that community the way that we're talking about, right? What we're talking about is actually drawing on voices that may have different ideas from one another, right? Fully appreciating the diversity in that community and helping to educate and inform people and pull the ideas out and translate them into solutions together with them. And what it reminds me of for those of you who, who may be attorneys on the call is that one of the things that we, we teach lawyers and people have to understand um, as young lawyers and old lawyers is the importance of someone's stated or expressed interests versus your own idea of what their best interests are, right? And so there are those areas in client representation where we defer to the client and what the client wants to do. And we do our best to counsel, but the client is the one calling the shots. And when we think about movement lawyering, I think about it the same way, right? What I'm trying to do is treat the community as the client. And I go out and we try to educate as best we can about all the evidence that we were just talking about, right? Like those things that we know about what works and what doesn't work to keep people safe. And instead of substituting my judgment for what's in the community's best interest or where I think things should go long-term, it's about really feeling out and understanding what's the change that people wanna see, what's the change that people are ready for in that moment, and how do they wanna approach it and trying to craft and tailor solutions about what those needs are. And every time I have these conversations, I learn something new beyond what I learned in my 10 years of litigation experience, right? I learned something new about a solution that I hadn't even thought of. And I just think it's really important for people to appreciate how much there is to learn, even when we've been doing this uh, for a very long time, even when we've seen it from different angles as someone who resides in the city and, and works in the city and um, has been in the community for a long time, there's always something to learn from folks who have, um, you know, been survivors of crime from folks who have been um, arrested or prosecuted or imprisoned. And so there's no real limit to the number of conversations you should be having. And there's no point at which we get to say, hey, we've engaged in the, in the meaningful stakeholder engagement and get to move on. All right. So I want to take a look at the chat and see if there are questions. And if other people have more questions for the Q&A, please, please feel free to share them. And I'm going to just go in the order that I see them on my screen. And I see a question um, asking, could the loss be the individuals in the community are not asking for what they feel needs to change in their community? And I apologize because I'm not sure exactly what I was speaking to when this question arose. And so please feel free to, to use the chat again and, and correct me if I'm not addressing the question that you are asking uh, precisely. But when we talk about the community sort of asking for what they need, I think it's important to understand that that's a conversation, right? That it isn't just a matter of like asking somebody who's out demonstrating what is it that you wanna see happen? I can see frustration happen in those conversations when people are saying, hey, we're out here protesting and what we're talking about is what we've seen that's wrong, right? And we are drawing attention to something horrific that's happened or something aggravating that's happened or something wrong or unfair that's happened. And they're not necessarily speaking to the solution that they wanna see or how they wanna approach it. And the person who wants to be involved as an advocate or wants to join that movement is uncertain of what the exact change is that folks want to see. And I think it's okay, right, to, to wait until the moment is right to have the conversation about how do we translate this problem that's identified into a solution, right? And who do we need to have at the table with us to figure out what that solution looks like? But we should respect the fact that that is still an appropriate call to action, right? To demonstrate and say, this thing happened and I want it to stop, right? Even if they don't articulate, this is how I wanna go about it stopping. I want it to be a legislative solution. I wanna see a change in department policy. I wanna see civil liability. I wanna see a change in training, right? It's, it's still a powerful call to action to say, this is what's happening where we live and we want it to end now. And we start to refine what are all the different ways of doing that. And that's how we ended up 
with 90 solutions for policing through the police reform commission we met every day almost for eight months with individuals and organizations just to hear from them what's wrong and then coming together with all of them and trying to figure out what can we do differently to make that wrong go away right and so i think just making space for all of those different exchanges is really, really important. And I'll see if there are, if there's any follow up on that one question, please feel free to put it in there. And we've got individuals outside of the community may have the teeth to add things to legislative bills, but they need to know exactly what the communities need, not what they think they need. And I think that's right in line with, with what we're talking about in terms of building those authentic connections. It is great to have um, support from large organizations, from national organizations, from places outside of our own locality that have had success in the way that we're trying to have success. And we just wanna make sure that we're doing it in a way that they're, that they're driving the work of and the ideas of people who live there and who are directly impacted instead of sort of parachuting in as we see sometimes with their own solution in mind and their own approach to advocacy in mind and, and really um, like sort of driving the narrative. We have a, a couple of examples of that in DC that I can think of and I'll try to, um, be as respectful as I can of like sort of the privacy of people involved. But for example, we had a, an initiative here where people wanted to decriminalize something and it was part of a national campaign. And when it came to DC, there were a lot of signs everywhere. There were a lot of mailers everywhere and they were relating this decriminalization effort um, to the police brutality that we see in DC a lot. And what they were trying to decriminalize actually wasn't something that we saw a lot of police enforcement of in DC at all. And so it struck people, I think, in seeing the signs and seeing the mailers, it was obvious that the, that the campaign wasn't really driven by people who uh, live in the communities that are most affected by policing. And in some ways there, was, there were things about that approach that were insulting, right, to folks to hear sort of the, the tremendous harm that policing has inflicted on those communities used as a talking point for someone else's agenda. And so that's the kind of, kind of thing that we wanna be really mindful of. Please forgive me as I'm reading slowly through all of these um, different comments. Thanks to everyone who said that they would love to get involved. Um, I will share out our contact information at the end, my, both my direct email address, but if you wanna follow along with DC, what DC Justice Lab is doing, we are on all the social channels as at DC Justice Lab and the students are really involved in, in sharing out all of our work. And so, um, Yes, please feel free to follow along with what's going on in DC. And if I can help you get connected to like-minded organizations in your own community, I'm happy to do that as well. I see a question about how has this work impacted immigrants and has there been collaboration with immigrant organizations and advocates? I love that question. I wanna say it depends on which aspect of the work we're talking about, but I wanna use the Police Reform Commission's work as an example. We had a police reform commission of 20 people, and I'm really proud of the recommendations that came out of that group. And I will say that the one thing <laughs> that I found um, that we didn't do a great job of was addressing the needs of immigrant communities in DC. And the reason that it didn't happen the way that I would have liked it to happen is that although we had 20 people who represented a decent cross-section of our community and, and diversity of viewpoints, we had these working groups, one of which was tasked with thinking about what is policing and what are the intersections between policing and immigration enforcement. And we had no one on our entire police reform commission who was actually an immigrant themselves. And so while we did meet with organizers and individuals, I still feel that something gets lost in translation and the priorities were, um, were maybe not as as good as they could have been if we had better representation in the body itself, in the decision-making body itself. So we learned, you know, we had a sanctuaries bill pending at the time and we heard, you know, support this measure. This is a really important measure. We talked about keeping ICE out of schools. We talked about um, the relationship between our courthouse, which is actually a federal courthouse because we're not a state, and ICE. 
um, in particular, and so really immigration enforcement. But I think there's so much more than just enforcement of um, of our detention and deportation laws at issue, right? One thing that comes to mind is we did include a recommendation in our policing proposals to decriminalize vending without a license. And that's something that affects immigrant communities disproportionately in DC. But I think we would have been able to identify more things like that if we had, um, if we had at the outset of developing uh, who was going to be on that body representation from, from the immigrant community. Um, so there has been collaboration between DC Justice Lab and those organizations, but I think I've seen sort of the other side of what that looks like in some of these other coalitions that exist in DC. And I think that's a voice that oftentimes gets muted or, or left out, um, at least in the District of Columbia, and we could do a better job of that for sure. Thank you for that question. And then I see another question saying, how do we address the concerns around public safety with efforts to decriminalize, essentially decriminalize blackness? I know these acts have recently been enacted, but anything to demonstrate the impact on safety. So we had a, um, a movement to decriminalize marijuana in DC, which was one of my first forays into policy work when I was still a practicing attorney. And what was interesting about the way we went about marijuana decriminalization here is that we weren't making any of the health arguments um, and we weren't really making that many public safety arguments. We were making a racial justice argument. We were really saying, look, just out of fairness concerns, if eight times as many people, um, if you're eight times as likely to be arrested for this, if you're black, than if you're white, we know something's going wrong. Right? We know that white people are also using marijuana. And so just out of concerns of, of um, equal protection, the council should decriminalize marijuana in DC. And when we were ironing out the details of what decriminalization would look like, the council ultimately decided to keep public smoking as something um, that was arrestable in the district. And we found that everybody who was arrested for public smoking was black, right? So even though we had decriminalization as small quantities, we had this public, public smoking provision that was still being used only against Black residents. So then we changed it to the, or sorry, the executive changed it to saying, okay, we're only going to ticket people for public smoking. And you can guess what happened there. The tickets were overwhelmingly, um, were overwhelmingly affecting Black residents. So I think this goes back to the point that I was making earlier about the need to really address how bias plays a role in all of the systems at once. It's really hard to just look at what are the numbers of people who are being sentenced without looking at what are the number of, of people being prosecuted? What are the number of people being stopped, being surveilled, right? Being having these 63,000 contacts with police in such a short period of time. And how do we eliminate bias and focus on things that are actually suspicious and pay attention to things that, um, that relate to risk and not to race? Um, and just trying to think about the last part of your question, anything to demonstrate the actual impact on safety. When I look at decriminalization of marijuana as the example, one thing that's really hard to measure is when you decriminalize something, not only is it gonna change the number of people incarcerated and the number of people prosecuted, it changes the bases, the number of bases available to police for that initial contact, right? So if marijuana is not illegal, it's harder to make an argument that the reason I stopped this person was I thought I smelled marijuana, right? Um, and so there's really no way to measure that impact of decriminalization. Uh, and so every time you're decriminalizing something, you should think about that as the broader public safety impact as well, that it's eliminating sort of unnecessary police contact. When we talk about safety overall, I can tell you that we have a lot of evidence from our numbers in DC, the kinds of aggressive policing we're seeing, and those tactics are yielding very, very little contraband. So when we have the tens of thousands of stops I'm talking about is not been effective in recovering, in recovering guns or in actually um, reducing or investigating gun violence in the city, which is the top public safety priority here in DC. Um, we're talking about less than 1% of the time. And then I see another question about how are we engaging with DC police and our efforts? And I'll tell you a couple of things going on with DC Justice Lab. One is the Police Reform Commission did um, speak with frequently the department and leadership in the department regularly 
we have done our own outreach to people in the executive branch of government here. And one person who works for DC Justice Lab now actually was a Metropolitan Police Department officer before he joined DC Justice Lab in an effort to, to transform policing here in DC. And so we have his perspective on a lot of things policing related, which is really, really nice. And something that I wouldn't have um, known a year ago would be a part of our team, but it really does help to understand um, that perspective and also what tools are available and are not available to police and to be able to, to put our heads together in that way. We had a change in, in police leadership and a change in our, um, in our executive leadership recently. And so what I'm hoping to see is our newer chief really engaging with the, uh, the recommendations made by the Police Reform Commission, which were issued in April. And we haven't really seen um, a, lot of, a lot of engagement yet. So that, that outreach has to happen. Our focuses for DC Justice Lab are really um, very much on trying to change the laws and less on implementation as some other groups are working on, but it's a really, really important, important piece of the work as well. So I know we only have five minutes left. I wanted to ask everybody, um, Anna, if I could, just this last poll question, right? So just thinking about, oh, and Kiki, if we could advance to that, um, sorry, beyond the Q&A slide, I forgot to cue some of these things, um, to our last poll question, right? So just thinking about, can you, uh, as attendees of the summit, go forward and help advocates in your community do more of any of the things we talked about today. So that's really reimagining policing, prosecution and punishment, prioritizing transformative and comprehensive change or centering the impacted voices and authentic collaboration or all three of those things. I'm really interested to see which of those pieces um, you feel are, are missing or could be advanced wherever it is that you're living, working or trying to, trying to make change happen. And I look forward to, to seeing the results of that poll. And we'll share with you also in closing, if we click through here, a few things that you can do if you have some time to dedicate to trying to move this, this work forward. I try to think about what can we do in one hour? What can we do in a week? What can we do in a year? What can we do in one minute? And so I wanted to share with you, you know, if you are thinking about, hey, I can spend an hour or a day or a week, here are some things we're thinking about. Um, doing. And again, really, really happy to connect with folks here and elsewhere uh, to see how we can get you plugged in to, to participate in any of these ways. While everybody's filling out that poll, I just really want to say thank you again to Upswell. I, I am so appreciative of being included here. I'm so impressed with the community that was built um, through this summit, not just this year, but before. And I'm excited to continue to stay connected with everyone else. I know that I shared our, our social media handle already, but on this very last slide, you'll see my email address. Um, and please feel free to reach out to me directly. I'd be happy to, to connect and collaborate with people um, going forward. And thanks so much for the thoughtful and insightful questions along the way. I hope that something I said here uh, will be helpful, helpful to you. And I hope that um, understanding that we were able to do quite a bit, you know, just as, as beginning as part-time volunteers last year um, and getting all the way to, to build changes here in DC, hopefully um, is encouraging to folks who want to do the same thing where they are. And we're happy to, to help support anywhere that we can. So thank you again. And I will pass it back to Anna. Well, thank you so much, Patrice, for that insightful presentation and for everything that your organization does. It is a pleasure to have you here at Opswell. We hope to see you again and to continue to promote the amazing mission that your organization does um, for, for enabling racial justice and, and, and equity. Thank you so much. Thank you all for watching. Thank you.